the moment it was nothing but exams, but soon it would be holiday time. This year, John wanted to do something really adventurous, and he decided he would like to go to the hills for a week. Frank, who left last term, was thinking along the same lines, and they arranged to meet after work one day and go and see someone who could give them some advice. They'd heard that all too often young people like themselves had met with accidents, simply through ignorance of a few elementary facts. Mr. Blake was expecting them and had brought out some of his own kit so that he could make a few suggestions. One of the most important items is an anorak made of strong, closely woven material. It ought to be moderately waterproof. Yes, you may have to resign yourself to getting wet, but this doesn't really matter if you're on the move. The whole point of an anorak is to keep out the wind. I should be a bit suspicious of buying so-called waterproof anoraks. These can be very uncomfortable because they may restrict perspiration. I wouldn't advise a leather jacket like yours, Frank. They do roughly the same job as an anorak, but you'll find it gets awfully heavy, especially after some rain. Trousers should be fairly wide in the leg and again of a fairly light material. A thick cloth may be warm, but it takes ages to dry out. Blue jeans are ideal, provided they are not too tight. A good warm sweater is an absolute essential, but John wasn't yet convinced that mountains can be cold places even in midsummer. And now we come to boots, the most important item of all. They looked a bit heavy to us, and in fact they were, but Mr. Blake was quick to tell us that the necessary strength and support could not be obtained with anything lighter. Just look at the pattern on the sole. There's plenty here for the rocks to grip on. A mountaineer should never be too big for his boots, and there ought always to be room for two pairs of socks inside them. It wasn't long before they took his advice, bought their boots and started breaking them in by wearing them as much as possible. Frank even walked to work, which was quite a change for him. John's boots were to win him a new friend, and it was not long before Derek was one of the party. This was an excellent idea, since three is a much safer number. Besides, Derek had done some mountain climbing before. Mum and Dad never thought I'd get as far as the station, let alone the hills, with this lot on me. John, Frank and Derek had chosen to go to the Lake District for their holiday, but there are several other regions they might have chosen. There's Wales, particularly Snowdonia in the north, or Scotland with its massive Cairngorm range, or the Ben Nevis area with Britain's highest mountain. Less rugged but very interesting are the Pennines and the Peak District. Besides all these, there are a lot of lower hills which are particularly suitable for a weekend trip or a less energetic holiday. In the Lake District, the boys were using one or two of the many youth hostels in the area where they had, of course, booked well in advance. Here they were able to get a bed for the night and meals, and at the same time they could meet and chat with other young people who had similar interests. Before going off for the day, Derek remembered to leave a note with the warden stating their route and rough time of return. This sensible precaution would cover them if anything went wrong. Mountains always look higher in the morning, particularly on the first morning. Frank was all for rushing ahead and showing the others just what could be done. But John wasn't quite so keen on the idea of a race to the summit. Come on, you slackers.
take it steady, Frank, and you'll get there just as quick in the end. John's comments about Frank's speeds were quite unprintable. Suppose they're right, really. When they had caught up, Derek decided to set the pace, and they all moved off at a nice, unhurried rate, putting their feet down squarely and firmly each time. They're beginning to get it now, so let's take a closer look. Whenever possible, get the whole foot flat on the ground. If you only walk on your toes like this, it's not so easy to balance and you'll soon get aching calf muscles. That's lovely now. With a pace like this, they'll always be together and there'll be no need to stop every 10 minutes or so. Once they had the hang of it, there seemed to be little to worry about until they found they could not see the top anymore. It was a good job they'd brought a map and compass with them. They could now put into practice all that they had learnt. First they identified those landmarks that they could still see. Their route was going to take them roughly west for a mile and a half up to the ridge and then south for a couple of miles to the summit. Now they had to work out with the aid of the compass the exact magnetic bearing that they would have to follow. They also estimated the time they thought they would arrive at the ridge as a useful check. Yes, that's obviously the way, judging by the steepness of the slope. They chose prominent boulders 50 yards or so ahead to guide them, and on reaching one they picked another on the same course with the help of the compass. If they could not find a suitable boulder, or if the mist got heavier, they sent Frank ahead a few yards to mark the way. He was positioned by the man with the compass while he remained just within sight. This may look slow, but it is the only safe way in thick mist. After a while, Frank came across a line of these cairns, or piles of rock, which coincided with their route. They're a real asset in weather like this. Timing seems okay. Now they've simply got to stick to the ridge, checking with the compass occasionally, as even ridges can do funny things. One of the nice things about mountain mist is that it often clears as quickly as it comes. Derek and his friends found that the first day's summit seemed to be getting further away rather than nearer. For a town dweller, even 2,000 feet seems quite a haul. Mountain climbing is hot work, but it's amazing how quickly you cool off once you stop for a rest. This is just the time to put on that spare sweater if you are to avoid a chill. Of course, if they had any sense, they'd get out of the wind by moving round slightly to one side in the lee of the summit. There's nearly always some protection if you take the trouble to look for it. Having lugged their lunch all this way up, they were determined to make the most of it. They'd brought a few sandwiches which, in spite of Frank's rude comments, were well filled with such things as paste, jam or honey. Derek had avoided thick slabs of meat which would not replace their energy quickly enough. The chocolate, dates and raisins which they'd brought were ideal energy foods but they resisted the temptation to eat the lot. 
A little may be useful in any possible emergency later on. They were just wondering whether to take their litter home or leave it under a convenient boulder. Hmm, they found the answer. Maybe John won't be quite so lucky another time. Let's hope that'll be the last boulder he'll ever send over a cliff. A lot of people will find going down the hardest part of all. There are a few techniques which will help, and Derek was soon showing them. On rough boulders, it's best to go for the bigger rocks which are less likely to tip up. The good walker will imagine a staircase in front of him and he'll try and tread on every rock with equal force, keeping the knees bent and the body ready for any unexpected slip. John was now beginning to regret wearing those tight jeans. Grass is not always as easy as it looks and Derek told them to pick out the tufts which looked like giving the best support. They don't always. Running down a mountainside can be very enjoyable, but it should of course only be done when you can see exactly where you're going. You should know your braking distance, just like a car, and make sure you can see to the end of it. Some people are scared of going down loose boulders or scree, and it can be very dangerous. It's mainly a matter of confidence and of not letting your body go faster than your legs. Lean well back and dig your heels in deeply. Unfortunately, Frank did not, and ended up by learning the hard way. Luckily, Derek had had the sense to pack a small first aid kit for just such an emergency. John thought this a jolly good excuse for some refreshment all round. Frank, insisting on being an invalid, demanded some Kendall mint cake. He did not need the label to tell him that this was a very pleasant way of acquiring some extra energy. While all this was going on, they hadn't noticed the weather. The mist had come to stay this time and it looked like bringing rain as well. John tried his hand at map reading now. They were near a stream and they knew that this led home. They decided to follow it, but found after a while that the going was easier if they kept a little to one side of it. With proper equipment, bad weather is no obstacle to your enjoyment, and the good mountaineer is just as much at home in wet weather as in fine. Frank's lack of training was now beginning to tell a bit. Derek did not want him to fall behind, as this is just the time of day that many a party gets split up and the consequences of separation can be serious. Yes, they felt they could read all this with a clear conscience. Fairly clear, anyway. As the days went by, they became quite proficient mountaineers, 
and was soon in the happy position of being able to pass on advice to others. Even Frank was able to tell them a thing or two. By now, rucksack packing was second nature, and if you intend to follow in their footsteps, don't forget to take these. A pullover for the lunchtime stop, sandwiches, and some form of concentrated food as a standby. A first aid kit, it's just the sort of thing you're bound to need if you forget it. And of course, a good reliable compass and map. Every one of these items is really necessary. They will help you to make the most of your holiday if you too are going to the hills.